Across the counties of Essequibo, Demerara, and Burbis, this is Kaicho Radio 99.1 and 99.5 FM. Kaicho Radio, the radio with a difference. Good afternoon. Welcome once again to Kaito Radio 99.1, 99.5, and we coming to you across the coast of Guyana and on Facebook. And of course, uh, uh, we are bringing you once again some critical updates uh, on another issue. Over the last couple of days, we would be we would have been talking to you on the elections, and we would have been bringing to you the guests, uh, not only the private sector but the political representatives and others, persons who are in the know. Uh, today there's another developing situation, and it's it it is uh, it has it has the possibilities of having a big impact on Guyana. As you know, in December we would have uh, started production on oil after preparation since 2015. Um, yesterday there was a major um, development at the stock exchange overseas, and and we know that uh, the price of oil would have uh, plummeted down below 20 i think 30 something dollars just below 25 dollars and that in itself has an impact with our production um what we're going to get at the end of the day so uh as of now uh, the company the exxon company and its partners hess and cnoc are telling us that the cost of production is around 35 dollars so anything below that it's not going to cut it so uh, there are impacts it has uh, uh, long-term and short-term impact on not only our economy but overseas what is happening so we have to pay attention to that as we speak right now also there's a major uh, development which I think the whole world would have been riveted over the past couple of weeks as well and that is what is known as the coronavirus um, as I'm speaking here now uh, the CNN is reporting that the National Guard that's uh, almost like the army has been deployed to the New York City suburb and where there is a major problem developing there. As we know, we should be paying attention to that because we have a large um, number of Guyanese who have migrated there and probably Guyanese who uh, ha- ha- has left Guyana and they ha- are, are visiting families and so there. So there they are implications to, to our travel arrangements, um, but it has also a big impact too on our um, trade with the U.S. and around the world. So today, I don't have all the answers to it, but of course, um, uh, we have two persons here, two individuals who are very close to the private sector, and one of them is no stranger to us. He's Nicholas Boyer, the president of the George Young Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, you were here yesterday on another platform. Today you were here again um, and you put on another hat. That is not only a businessman but as the president of the GCCI. Also here, of course, and we welcome in him, at least I am for the first time, as the executive director of the GCCI, Richard Ramaran. And gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Leonard. So I, I think, I'm not sure if I'm capturing it, it uh, correctly there, um, but uh, uh, it, there's uh, two things that is happening right now. The fall in the oil prices, and of course, it has an impact. Um, the coronavirus is something that we should be paying attention to. Before I came here this morning, I, I had a call to the Commissioner General of the Guyana um, Revenue Authority, that's Godfrey Stacia. We've been um, hearing some complaints that uh, at the wharves and at our outlying areas like Letham, and so there's been some delays in the clearing of goods. I, my sources at GPL is telling me that they can't clear some parts here, which is going to have an impact on their maintenance schedule for our engines. So uh, I'm going to ask you right away, the president of the GCCI, Nicholas Boyer, what is happening here? What's the correlation between coronavirus, 
what happened on Wall Street yesterday and uh, the, the, the drop in oil, um, oil prices to very worrying levels. Well, thanks for that introduction. And the key thing that is happening here is that we are obviously in China over, let's say, around December, you had the outbreak of the coronavirus. And then what happened there? Because, I mean, China's had some of these outbreaks before in SARS, for instance. But what was different about the coronavirus was the speed at which it spread and the manner and steps in which they took to qu try and quarantine the virus. Um, unfortunately, the quarantining has not it is now getting to the point where they're seeing declines in the number of new reported cases in Wuhan, so we're, we're the, outbreak, the epicenter of the outbreak. But you now see news today, uh, for instance, Italy is shutting down all non-essential travel. I have here on my iPad, I'm looking, the National Guard is being deployed to a New York City suburb where a one-mile containment zone is going up. Well, what happened is that the coronavirus has an, had an impact on the world economy and world trade because when China had to start to shut down to put in its containment measures for the virus that means a lot of production and trade started to slow down tourism started to show down slow down transportation started to slow down and then the impact of that is there's a destruction of demand in the oil industry so I think one of the figures I had seen quoted was somewhere around 3 million barrels per day was wiped out in demand in the oil industry. Now, the global economy is this kind of interconnected chain. So when you have that type of disruption in one country and then a global market such as the oil markets, it then disrupts other markets that feed off of that market. Because for instance, the transportation and tourism industries are directly affected. Then you have real estate investment that's affected, investment in hotels, restaurants, and, and buildings that, where services are provided. So that is coming, and what we are seeing is that domino effect now come into the Caribbean and the CARICOM region. But um, um, be before we come to you, Mr. Rammer, and this is extreme, uh, extremely worrying as I'm looking at it here, New York, and we know I think you and I would, could, could say that we have family and friends over there. I have many, many friends. And, and I'm just reading some headlines from CNN. Two of the United States' largest airliners grounded flights. Um, there's some whiplash uh, turnaround on the markets, um, where the markets aspect uh, has given investors to say whiplash. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a virus, there's a total lockdown, as you said, uh, Nick in Italy, but uh, the hope is rising in China. Some good news here, maybe. Uh, nationwide lockdowns are legal, but how long are people going to obey them? So you have those issues. So we have people going back and forth from over there, and then um, you look uh, the, that maybe there's a stance from the government. Well, let's talk, uh, um, Mr. Ramaran, you have a background in finance and maybe economy and the uh, uh, economy as, as it is. Could you tell us what are some of your takeaways from those little topics that we've been talking about there? So thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction and, and the segue into this discussion. I think I want to start or con and conjecture the entire discussion on, on three, three main things. Um, firstly, is that the global economy is now an interrelated economy and they are all dependent on each other. Um, the structure that we have currently around the world, it's an international architecture where one, the, the, the impact that an event in one country has on another country is much greater than it would have been maybe say 200 years ago. So that's the first thing that we have to understand within the international architecture. Um, secondly, the market for oil prices, it's not one that is driven by only a singular variable. There are a number of other variables that affect it too. And um, we make reference in economics and finance about something called the animal spirits of the market. The market goes with ebbs and flows of the economy and what's happening in the global village um, in, in, in contemporary times. Now, what is, what is so alarming about this situation is the rate at which the coronavirus is moving globally. Uh, I think there are some graphics that explain it pretty well that shows 
by the 20th day as opposed to SARS and other uh, major global health pandemics essentially that we have had, it is exponentially risen from the 10th day to the 20th day as opposed to those others. And what that does is that it puts markets into a state of disarray and through animal spirits, as we call it, send people into a frenzy. Why this is so important for everyone worldwide is that oil and what the price of oil is, is very important because it, oil is a production, is an input into any production process. You're talking about transportation, actual manufacturing, logistics, powering lights for administrative operation, getting people to work. So the impact that that has on a variety of economic activities is very important. And how that coronavirus actually affects logistics in this global market and this global village, which we now call planet Earth, is very important. Um, so th that would be where um, if you were to look at the interrelatedness of those three, globalization, world oil, oil prices, and, um, and the coronavirus, I would say that that's the nexus that we can identify from the outset amongst the three variables. So, um, Nick, uh, I, I want to bring this right home to, to you now. You're a businessman, and I know um, if nobody knows you by now, I, I think I should tell them that your family has one of the biggest hardware business in here, national hardware. Um, and and you also involved in other businesses. I think you and I in initial discussions, um, you indicated that one of the worrying things that we'd have to look at is the exchange rates. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little how what's the correlation there? So what would happen is obviously is that the, the question of how we are trading with the world and that. So what I'm saying is, the exchange rate is determinant on how we exchange goods with the world. So, you know, and as well as interest rates. So in pure economic theory, they have all these models they can construct, for instance, interest rate differentials. But that's, that's all nice and academic. From a layman's term, it's pretty much how much do we produce, do we export, and then how much do we import? So how much foreign exchange do we earn, and how much foreign exchange do we need to spend based on what we import that determines the exchange rate essentially and what would happen here in how coronavirus would affect it is the destruction of demand because when you have populations that are now being quarantined how much demand can they have they're obviously going to curtail their daily activities to just what is essential for them to do for instance the whole of Italy is on lockdown I mean People, I was listening to the, new, the international news this morning, and Italy is saying that there's a curfew in effect. No, no you know, non-essential travel. If you're outside, you can only interact with somebody from like one meter, which is about three feet away. So you can imagine what that's doing to restaurants. Let's use restaurants, for instance, to, to show the destruction of demand. So some of the small local restaurants are having to close their doors at least for this period and they're hoping with a definite period but it could be indefinitely until the Italian government re removes those restrictions right so what do you think happens to the demand for food for items going in as food commodities that's gonna drop because then people are just gonna eat what they're gonna consume at home and what's necessary to be consumed at home any sort of extra or additional disposable items or, or, or consumption that was you know, for fun, not just directly needed. So are you going to buy extra beer in Italy? No. So when that demand is destroyed, it now comes back into the production side. Because in the supply side, are you going to produce a million units and not know whether you're going to sell the million units? And then further, China is a huge producer of raw materials that then get turned into products somewhere down the line, whether directly in China or other countries so if e eventually you're gonna find that some factories for whatever the product is are going to be looking and struggling to find raw material suppliers to fill the gap that China was you know taking up so when you have forced the destruction of demand and now you have some amount of res supply restriction that is natural because of loss of raw materials 
but then added to that you're gonna have factory managers reducing their production levels because they're trying to match the demand level prices will collapse that's what's happening in oil right so oil let's go back to oil three million barrels per day in demand was wiped out that is worrying deeply yeah. deeply worrying and then you see the saudis realizing that that demand is wiped out they want to capture as much market share as they can because they probably have a certain amount of their budget they want to meet with funds from the oil industry so they have now instituted a price war with russia as a result mm -hmm. and so the price of oil has collapsed to about 34 to 36 dollars per barrel I, I just looked it up um depending on whether you're quoting west texas in intermediate or brent yeah and as a result of that now you know if you're in the oil industry i saw uh rice that in um an energy consulting company that produces information economic forecast says that capital spending of the oil industry is going to have to be looked at so that could mean i'm not saying i have consulted or know for sure but i'm hazarding a guess and a bet that you could see unless this situation has some sort of definite start and end you could see some of the projects in guyana kind of say hold up we need to rethink on this just right now it's not that they may mm. never be developed but not at this at least at this price but let me let me bring you up to speed before Mr. we come to you mr ramber um a normal guy and these don't have an uh, don't really have a clue what we're talking about really but let me bring bring some things i mean some uh, at least the majority i think um and i'm learning as i'm here too um we had an issue downstairs there i think i think glenn had wanted uh, some face mask and it's made in china and you go wrong, George, because of what it is, you couldn't get anything. I saw, I was online, and I think somebody was having these, what you call, I, there's a name for it. Um, uh, there's an emergency pack that you could walk with, a flashlight, mask, and water, water bottles, and whatever. And somebody who was not uh, getting any kind of business, somewhere down in Norway, started doing tremendous business. As a matter of fact, they, they, for the last three weeks, the amount of business that they had, within those last three weeks was more than last year. Yeah. So there, there's a, a particular name for that emergency pack that you could buy. Mm -hmm. But he was getting online as people were calling him, do you have any more, could, could we get it? And so I think it was, he was one, from one of those doomsday kind of um, okay. organization that he always said the wall is coming so get this <laughs> up already and get this yeah. up in the bunker or something. But we need to start getting, um, a, a, I, I just saw a comment here which says, you know, coronavirus a hoax eat oranges um that that may be a case where well, whatever it is but at the end of the day we cannot look at the knock-on effects the ripple effects of what is happening across the world we live in with it um the, the whole world is frightened um new york is taken new york is almost like a lockdown there now yeah. and so mr ramaran let's hear some of the take uh, just, some of your thoughts just one thing um that nicholas would have mentioned there and i want to introduce another dimension into what he was talking about talking about the collapse in demand and then a decline in who supplies because of that collapse in demand but then we also have to remember too that firms hire people and we are looking right now at a short-term effect in terms of firms reducing their output but if we have a situation where this type of epidemic is not controlled and contained then you would, might have a situation of sustained uh, reduction in demand and if a firm can't supply um, goods and services to the amount that it used to one of the knock-on effects of that is that it's going to have to send people home well th those are large realities i was yes. talking to one of uh, guyana's biggest rice miller mm -hmm. this morning here yes. and he says right away we have orders for the rice now um of course because of the the political stuff he can't send anything to the war there's a slowdown there yes. there thereabouts I spoke to the GRA boss and he says, look, uh, we, as far as we know, they're supposed to continue the WARP activities, but it could be an individual uh, uh, thing. We're not sure. But he's saying with regards to our trades, our future trades and so on, he says there is going to be, if this con situation continues, there is going to be uh, less demand for rice which has of course uh, a ripple effect across yes. there so these are very real things that we'd have to look at if you look at the, the fact that the the, the oil price uh, would have dropped it's not only going to affect our what we get from um exxon but uh, while somebody might say yes our gas price is going to be cheaper the the problem with that is also uh, there's going to be demand or less demand 
for goods overseas and i think those are things that i'm looking at I, i'm really worried also and i want you to tell me a little bit this what are your thoughts uh, mr amber as to what kind of impact is this going to have on our travel between here and new york we got a big business going on between yes. here and new york and if new york i see a couple of our folks uh, looking at us listening to us here um they would be extremely worried so let me hear i, I i'm not sure we're learning here now there are two elements that one has to look at outbound travel and then inward travel um, and considering both elements would be absolutely essential so i won't just say new york but you also have other global uh, metropolitan areas so for example toronto so for example in the united kingdom certain metropolitan areas within the caribbean um, we will we do face the very real possibility of having either travel restricted to or travel restricted from those areas because containment of it will have to be something that is decided from the very outset how do we actually contain so you have to identify what the problem uh, where the problem actually lies then be able to to uh, sterilize that problem, quarantine that, that problem, and then work on the issue there. The public health specialists um, have processes that they go through for this. Uh, so the material impact on it will also be affecting travel or impacting on travel, but also very much importantly is the trade, the trade in goods and also the trade uh, in some services that occur. So it is a, an, an extraordinarily worrying thing because of the linkages that we have with those global metropolitans. As you know, we have a very large diaspora population uh, in those areas. Nick, I think you want let, let, let me Let me add an, another dimension to you. As these guys who are, let's say, on restriction or you see a, a lack of demand, earnings go down or for, for whatever the, the reason, remittances are going to go down too. Because they, they, you know, auntie sitting in New York may be sending you a hundred every two months, but she might not be able to soon send you that hundred two mo- in every two months. So remittances are also another uh, shoe to drop, uh, so to yeah. speak. But I want to weigh into another thing here. Obviously, there, there are many persons watching and listening um, uh, at this program here now. And there are some who believe that, you know, like for example there's one here that says uh, the coronavirus will not survive in hot countries i think this morning we were learning within a few minutes ago jamaica has its first case yes. as well as um, haiti i think florida has too so when it's not whether it could survive here or not is it's a fact that there's an impact on Guyana. new york is a, is heavily affected so whether we like it or not it's going to have an impact on not only travel and look what Nick has said there just now the auntie in Guyana who's there who's waiting for some money yeah. is going to think but not only that um while we might want to have the conversation go how ready is Guyana to deal with it the fact is that we got to deal with these fallouts from what is happening in Italy in the lockdown globally. we are uh, we are dealing with Europe with our trade as well yes. um so these are things global village and you very much as an eco- economist with a um, or finance background would be able to understand that what we do here or what we don't do here would have a knock-on effect as, as yeah. over there. So Nick, are we ready here? So far, I, I, so I, I was contacted by one of the doctors within the Chamber of Commerce and he says he thinks that the Ministry of Health has sufficient protections in place. But the thing is, is that, I mean, I, I hear what he's saying and I do understand and give credit that the Ministry of Health has put some things in place. But mm-hmm. I could tell you, I was in China when SARS broke out and there were a couple of basic things that I saw. So you would have at the airports, for instance, so when SARS would, as it, at its height um, and you flew into China, they would have these complete thermal scanners. So what you, it was not a case where you know, somebody's pointing a, a, a thermal gun at somebody to, to see what temperature they are. These, they, they're these scans that as you're walking through and they put the, 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 the scans up on a, a, a video screen, you're walking through, you can see the, the, the temperature of a person in co- uh, color coded and you can tell who has a temperature of above a certain degree. So the Chinese were, were that you know, during SARS. Now here, I haven't even seen a basic set of screening, which is just somebody asking questions. So basic screen, let's, 
So that was very advanced screening by the Chinese in, in, in that time. Basic screening, and I saw in some other places, they would challenge you. Oh, have you been to this country or this country recently? Where are you coming from? Okay, and they would do it at random at first, or they would pick passengers and, and do the thermal gun scan to see, okay, what's your, um, you know, your temperature, and they do it at random. I haven't seen that put into our airports as yet, so that has surprised me that we haven't started there. As to what GPHC has done, that I'd be unclear on. So I wouldn't speak to things that I haven't seen. But I, I, what I would say, though, is that imagine this blew up in China, and these guys were building hospitals in weeks. We can't, we, we can't build hospitals in years. They were building it in weeks to put the contained patients in, and it still blew up. So I hear what they're saying, but... If China wasn't able to do it, do you think we can do it? If Italy wasn't able to do it, you think we can do it? And there's just one particular feature, um, one particular feature about those economies, those developed economies that is fundamentally different from ours, is the fact that those economies are very paper-based and plastic-based in the way that they conduct transactions. Um, Guyana is a cash-based economy. And if one has been following uh, the finance news over the past couple of weeks, you'll see, that th you'll see that they identify hard currency, money, as being one of the major uh, instruments through which coronavirus and, 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 uh, can actually be passed. So a cash-based economy like Guyana, the quantum of risk that it poses for an average individual transacting their daily business is very high. And don't forget the nature of this um, of this virus is one that if one comes into contact with it you don't demonstrate any symptoms etc for for a couple of weeks or for a particular period of time mm -hmm. so that feature of our economy where it is cash based in nature um, puts the average consumer and the average Guyanese person at a greater risk and the containment of it will be more uh, uh, of course more difficult but there's going to be some um, positive things on some other aspects of our economy here. Um, one of the safe havens, of course, is gold. People yeah. run to gold whenever there are problems with the um, with the other the stock exchanges and so on. And um, we know over the last couple of weeks, gold has been pretty good in terms of prices. I think I think online now is about sixteen hundred and fifty-seven dollars per ounce US. Um, and then we know it's been rising. Do you foresee, gentlemen, um, a raise in a, a sharp hike in this current price? Oh, uh, I'm not sure if I would say a sharp hike in the current price because oh. there has been a hike in the price. Because yeah. currently, I just want to pull it up. Gold, uh, last I checked, was somewhere around 1600 and ounce. Pull it up right now. That's about 1657 now. That means something is going yeah, on. Yeah, 1654. I mean, of course, back in the financial crisis in, in 2010, we've seen it climb all the way to 1800. I, mm. yeah. It's one of those things where it depends on how panicked everybody is in the response and how panicked everybody is in terms of their buying of gold quickly um, to hoard as a safe haven asset. Yeah. Um, gold, of course, as you know, is an industry that employs a certain number of people um, and the production of it occurs and they have a certain amount of equipment that is able to produce over and above what capacity they are currently producing at or what their current output is. Um, but what happens to the other sectors in the economy too? Yes, I do accept that gold provides a natural hedge against the falling commodity prices. But what happens in the other uh, sectors is very important for the employment aspect. Because if you have a, a, even a sustained period of a couple of weeks where persons in those labor-intensive industries and those labor-intensive sectors are faced with declining commodity prices, can't reach um, their break-even or can't reach a point where they're able to cover their costs, then they do end up in a problem if it's a sustained period of, of, of a drop in commodity price. So gold, yes, will be able to hedge the economy against decline uh, or declines in other sectors, but the material impact that it will have on the livelihood of those employed in the other sectors, that in itself becomes a problem. So yes, gold does provide a natural hedge as we would have seen in the 2008 uh, Great Recession. Mm -hmm. but. 
those are the sectors, those are the ones, particularly the labor-intensive labor ones, that may have um, issues that, that will come. Interesting. Um, Nick, on our front page of Kaichu News today, there's uh, the, the main headline, crisis on oil market put significant dent in Guyana's first year of revenues from Eliza One project. Um, and uh, this is the opinion of one of our um, contributors, um, Charles Ramson Jr., um, commentator rather. So, do you see, do you see a big impact or dent in the economy um, if this is sustained? Of course, and and so just for full full disclosure, Charles is the head of our petroleum committee at the Georgetown Chamber, and I agree with him. the The fact is is that I think a lot of projections were done with oil at between fifty to sixty dollars a barrel. Yeah. And a lot of us were counting our chickens before they hatched. Mm -hmm. they, they, and, and this is one of the things we learn in, 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 in Richard's an economist. I, I, I study finance. One of the first things we learn in doing projections. Projections are great, but reality can sometimes wildly differ. And so what that means is whatever funds we will earn offshore when we lift that oil, it could be sold into an environment where the price is almost just a little bit over half of what we were expecting it to be so we would definitely see a shortfall and a lot less earnings coming from the oil field not to mention whatever other impacts happen in the economy because of trade well you know the, the, the thing that I'm looking at I was looking at the, the fractured relations between Saudi Arabia and the Russia right now because there's a whole thing and if Saudi Arabia the cost of production is between I think about six or seven dollars I think mm -hmm. it is yeah. and our cost of production for that oil out there is about thirty five dollars so you can't beat them and I think they could be able to lock up one of the pipes uh, just at the drop of a hat because they have those it's on land it's not in in, yeah. in the sea or anything um, so you're really dealing with a monster there and so if we to 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 do a projection that that situation is going to continue in the maybe medium term yes um we're looking at some serious effects if we do projections based on the revenue of our oils right now and that is a worrying scenario yeah. you see the thing is is that and and even to, to be fair uh the center for local business development which is the kind of business accelerator that exxon funded and created mm -hmm. You know, they had brought a speaker down to explain that oil markets are this ro volatile roller coaster, and this virus is just kicking into gear that roller coaster for us. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a diversified economy. We have to have economic policies that focus on having a diversified economy because oil is good and it is one more weapon in our economic arsenal but it can't be the only weapon in the economic arsenal now what is particularly um what is particularly not, not noteworthy about oil is that um the degrees of volatility that it faces the ebbs and flows of the of the cycle of prices for oil is one that is consistently volatile you will not find oil prices staying uh, constant for an extended period of time and as such um, when you do financial projections you invoke something called a conservatism concept where you plan for the absolute worst or the absolute lowest that it can possibly go um, so this is why it is important that in moving forward in the medium term Guyana begins to separate out in its accounting of, of, of uh, public revenues non-oil from oil and how we are managing the non-oil component of our economy because a scenario like this thankfully we are not three four or five years into production um, or thankfully we are not in a situation like like Trinidad where they have forced their economy along the lines of oil production yeah, we Only have a diverse a kind of diverse kind of economy we have, a, we have a number of sectors that are still in operation so moving forward and this is where the 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 uh, nexus begins to come with public financial management because we have to have in place different instruments and mechanisms in our laws and our financial architecture that we are able to cover for that volatility. 
the natural resources fund or, or a sovereign wealth fund is one step in that direction but the planning and how we project and how we manage people's expectations is also very important because in doing public policy or the art of public policy managing expectations through proper communication etc is important so if you are going to tell people that you're going to do xyz um, and you are basing that on um, a particular price in oil and uh, revenues that you'll receive then a reality may step in where individuals will not be able to see xyz materialize so we have to be very cautious and i made this point um speaking at a couple of other forums but we have to be very cautious of how we manage the expectations of the guyanese people from the oil and gas industry and what will materialize from it because there are very real considerations to be made but absolutely and you know um we are gonna have to break in a very short while because as you know three o'clock uh, our court case uh, yeah, with the yes. election uh, is going to start so quickly gentlemen um uh, if you're not joining us we have a, a discussion here because of the developments of what would have happened not only in the united states new york uh, but it's what's happening around the world especially in europe and in china um that situation with the coronavirus is having a big impact i think uh, uh, as we speak now um the national guard has been called out to uh, sections of new york because they want to contain that situation there we have thousands of Guyanese living there and so any travel between Guyana and 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 the new york and by the rest of the world we not left insulated um we have we face a very real threat there's some feeling that because of our temp temper um our hot country here that it's not going to affect us, but I could tell you that uh, Jamaica has a thing. I'm not sure if it's a confirmed case, but they are looking at a. It's a confirmed yes, case. It's a confirmed so case. So we have it here. We have it in next uh, neighbor here, and it's something we have to look into. We 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 might see travel restrictions. We might very well see a number of things that's going to happen. That's going to have an impact. So we're not only looking at a drop um, or a major dent in the stock market because of the coronavirus. We are also looking. At at the, the oil prices, which has, has plummeted below $35, which is the cost of production for Exxon. So it would have an impact on what we're going to get this year. So these are conversations that we uh, are looking at at the moment. And so, gentlemen, quickly, um, could uh, is there anything else that we could say to the Guyanese people? Yeah, so just to, to summarize, I mean, the key thing here is that the coronavirus is not this far off thing that is only affecting China and won't get to our shores. What the case in Jamaica, because even for me, I, I won't lie to you, I had a, you know, well, all right, maybe it, by the time it gets to the Caribbean, they'll have a, vi a, a vaccine for it. But at this point, with Jamaica's first confirmed case, it's now a question, can we get a vaccine before it gets to Guyanese shores? Secondly, the world economy because when we say the stock market the average Guyanese person is far removed from the the US stock market except for what they see on TV CNN or other business news the world economy we are interlinked with it we are somewhat insulated in the financial sector but in the real sector in goods and people moving across we're not insulated from this and it's going to have a shock here and then with our new industry which is the oil industry this is the first real show that this is a commodity like any other commodity very volatile and we need to have coordinated plans in place um, to be able to have an economy that can be braced for this and so that's that's our perspective what i'd like to say is that please check us out on gcci.gy is one of the things i keep forgetting to do thank you very much okay yes yeah. um my final so nick wrapped that up very nicely but my final contribution with this um i would like to concur with everything that nick has said but i want to add another dimension to it is that once once coronavirus for example is in the caribbean we are within a single market and economy construct within the region and there is free movement of people around this region we don't need a visa to go any any one of the caribbean islands or the caricom islands rather um and that is something which is extraordinarily worrying so whilst whilst the degree of in the degree of inter integration um, amongst the caricom states is uh higher than if we were not integrated or if there was not the csme it does also have this 
unintended consequence of if there is a pandemic that occurs there um, regionally, how do we respond to that? That is a, a point which we now need to take major stock of. Um, we need to be very cognizant of it. Um, and that fact that it's there means that it's only a matter of time. Hopefully that we do not reach there because I'm not sure how much our public infrastructure or healthcare public infrastructure can withstand something of that nature. Final thing that I want to say is that the point about oil price volatility and where it is happening, when it is happening, is a great lesson for Guyana at the beginning. I think of it comes year. early right. I think so. I agree with you on it that. It comes at a point where it is important and it is instructive for us to understand that this commodity is not going to be all, uh, you know, all giggles and, and, and fancy fancy stuff. It's, it, it is very real and we have to be able to properly integrate it into our public financial architecture. If I could just add one thing, I, I received a WhatsApp while we were here from one of my friends who's a medical doctor and she said, please, please share freely for people to call to know how to access medical care responsibly as opposed to turning up at a clinic or emergency room potentially exposing others to infection or panic this is to deal with coronavirus and apparently there's a coronavirus hotline here in guyana the number is 227 86 83 extension 215 let me go that over it's 227 86 83 extension 215 and that's from a, a doctor friend of mine mm -hmm. who is i guess um, it's suddenly becoming a buzz. Mm -hmm. So, so we we are dealing with some serious issues, and don't forget our growth rate in terms of travel that, that has been going right to the roof. Um, many more persons traveling to Guyana and from Guyana, and because of the oil industry and the, that that has been happening, we know that uh, Exxon employees have been flying in and out uh, American Airlines, which is one along with Delta, which was just cancelled a lot of flights in America. They've been bringing them and and in and out every two weeks. So we, 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 we are facing a very real threat and we know that we don't have that capacity. So this is a conversation that we need to have. So gentlemen, thank you very much. I, I wish we could talk a little longer than this, but we'd have to continue the conversation. Definitely. Nicholas Boyer, um, President of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and of course the, his Executive Director, um, Richard Wambaran. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Definitely. And uh, we're going to see each other very shortly sometime again. Yes. Definitely. Thank you very Definitely. much. Definitely. Thank you. Anytime. So, if you're not joining us, um, this is, we, we had a discussion there on the economy and coronavirus. Uh, we are going to try to get you a link on to the court, now to the high court, where Chief Justice Roxon George is, uh, is due to uh, start again on the case which is involving the returning officer of GCOM for Region 4, uh, Claremont Mingo. And uh, there's a case against him not to have released uh, the result until the procedures to verify those results of Region 4 um, uh, that has happened. And this afternoon, that case continues. We're hoping to not only have a resolution, but to talk to the persons or the people that are involved with that. And I think after 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, we're going to bring those people on air. Um, to have them give their view as we have been doing over the last couple of days. So I thank you very much and we're going to be back a little later. I'm your host Leonard Gildari.